Good afternoon. Welcome to the Middle East Institute. Your Excellency Said Badar Al Hamad Boussaidi, uh, Her Excellency Hunayna Mulgari, we are indeed honored to uh, welcome you to today's talk, which will examine the role of Oman as a mediator in a variety of diplomatic and arms crises in the region. Oman has had a long-standing policy of maintaining its neutrality in the face of, of many conflicts uh, in the Gulf and in its neighborhood. This is very wise, <laughs> but the Sultanate is also far from having a passive foreign policy. Oman has maintained diplomatic relations with Iran, trade relations with Qatar, and borders the very troubled state of Yemen, while it continues to engage productively with all of its GCC neighbors. Amman has facilitated dialogues in several complex diplomatic and armed uh, uh, deadlocks in its very quiet but extremely effective way. And we in the United States recall with gratitude uh, the release of several young hikers uh, who were incarcerated. Oman negotiated their release a few years ago. And Oman played uh, initially a very constructive role in facilitating talks between the United States and Iran over its nu nuclear development program. So how does, uh, questions we'll want to examine today. How does o o Oman's foreign policy strategy allow for such flexibility in adapting to new and the protracted conflicts in the region? Can Oman continue to serve as mediator and facilitator in the future, even as the humanitarian crisis in Yemen worsens and the GCC gutter rift widens? So here to discuss um, these questions, we're very honored to have His Excellency Said Badr bin Hamad al Saidi, uh, Secretary General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Sultanate of Oman. Uh, His Excellency, Said Badar has worked in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs since 1988. For the last decade, he has headed that ministry as its Secretary General. The conversation is being moderated by MEI's Director for Gulf Affairs and Government Relations, Ambassador Jerry, Jerry Firestein. Jerry joined the Middle East Institute in uh, 2016 after uh, over four decades in the American Foreign Service where he served as ambassador to Yemen, and most recently before retiring as principal deputy assistant secretary for the Near Asian Bureau. Before I turn over uh, the podium to, for this fascinating discussion, uh, let me remind you all uh, to moot your telephones. We have several cameras uh, at the back of the room, uh, and we don't want you to be embarrassed if your phone goes off. But keep your phones on, because we do encourage you to tweet. And uh, if you do so, please use the hashtag, hashtag MEI Oman. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wendy, for your kind introduction. And it's really nice to see you, Ambassador Jerry, after such a long time. And thank you all for taking some of your time to come and, and meet me here this afternoon. The United States and Oman signed their first treaty of amity in 1833. The Sultan of the time, Sultan Saeed bin Sultan, sent a diplomatic envoy to this country, and he was received in New York in 1840. And an American consulate first opened in Muscat in 1880. Exactly 100 years later, in 1980, we signed what was then for the region a groundbreaking military access agreement. The Soviet Union was in Afghanistan, the Carter Doctrine newly in force. The challenges may change over time, 
But the core principles of our policy, of our Omani policy, remains the same. Respect for the rule of law, for the UN system, and for the UN Charter and the principles it reflects. We also have a strong preference for quiet diplomacy because we find it the best way to get results, which is why you would probably won't be hearing sensitive specifics from me during this talk. We believe in non-interference, and in particular, the pursuit of good relations with all of our neighbors, which is why I have chosen as my title for today, Love Your Neighbor. <laughs> I thought I should start by having a look at what some of the great religions say about this. Love your neighbor as yourself. This, Jesus tells one of the scribes at the temple of Jerusalem in the gospel according to Mark, is the second of the two commandments that everyone should follow. And it is worth noting that this command goes further than the requirement that we should love our neighbor. It requires that we should love them in the same way as we love ourselves. It seems the aim of this demand is that we should always struggle not just to assist our neighbor, to offer them food, clothing, shelter whenever they are in need, but to live as, as though we were them. Above all, to see the world through their eyes. An almost identical demand appears throughout the key sacred texts of Islam. For example, in the Sahih Muslim collection of the Hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, you can read, none of you have faith until you love for your neighbor what you love for yourself. Once again, the neighbor appears not just as the person who should be loved, but as the person through whose eyes we should seek to understand the world. And Rabbi Akiva, born not long after the passing of Jesus, is quoted by the Jerusalem Talmud as saying, love your neighbor as yourself. This is the great principle of the Torah. Now, what does this have to do with foreign policy? Well, stripped of its ethical or sacred connotations, it might mean something like this. Always start from the assumption that you and your neighbor share the same fundamental interests. We do, after all, share the same planet. I'm aware, or I'm aware that this might seem to fly in the face of many orthodox accounts of international relations which assume what is called a realist attitude on the part of global actors like states. In this realist approach, states pursue what they see rightly or wrongly as their own interests, which will compete or even come into direct conflict with the interests of their neighbors. The successful foreign policy is therefore the one which obtains maximum gains for you, according to the realist logic, and losses for the other. This is a zero-sum game. A different approach, more consistent, if I may suggest, with the command to love your neighbor, 
would be one in which no negotiation is ever seen as a zero-sum game. You enter the process not seeking to maximize gains in line with your own perception of your own interests, but by seeking to understand the interests of your neighbor. What does he want? How might what he wants be compatible with, that, with what I want? Is there some solution to this problem that neither of us have yet thought of that might turn out to work better for both of us? The zero-sum approach proceeds from an analysis of your own interests. You don't need to talk to anyone else to know what they are. You can just proceed to advance and secure your own interests. The alternative is to put your own interest to one side for a moment and start with your neighbor's interests. This is the key. The only way to love your neighbor, the only way to see the world as though you were your neighbor is by finding out what you really what, his, what your neighbor really wants and what your neighbor really thinks about. The answer, therefore, always starts with the dialogue. And dialogue starts with listening. It may sound strange to say that the Gulf today faces its most profound crisis for 30 years. After all, have we not witnessed innumerable acute crises over the last 38 years or so? The Iraq-Iran war, the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, the American invasion of Iraq and its aftermath, the dispute between Iran and the West over Iran's nuclear program? Why say that the crisis now is more acute than before? What I mean when I say this is that I think the present situation may involve a restructuring and a reorganization of regional relationships after which the Gulf, my neighborhood, will be configured in new and as yet unpredictable way. The earlier crisis may turn out to have prepared the way for these reconfigurations. Until now, the basic architectural structure of Gulf security has remained more or less intact, even if it has sustained some damage. Now, I think it may be in a process of transformation. I would like to focus on three aspects of regional architecture. The first is what I would call the logic of containment. During the 1990s, containment, sometimes articulated by American policymakers as dual containment, emerged as the name for a general approach to the Gulf region, led by the United States, but broadly shared by their allies in the region. Dual containment referred to the attempt by the United States to limit the capacity of Iran and Iraq to threaten the stability of the region. But it was, it was really only a variation on a more overarching US approach, primarily focused on Iran as the principal threat to regional stability. Iraq under Saddam Hussein emerged only relatively briefly as the clear threat. After all, it had been a de facto ally of the US and the West until 1990, 
and after the overthrow of Saddam Hussein in 2003, became so again. Iran, however, had been seen as a threat to American interests fairly continuously since the revolution of 1979. And this threat perception was widely shared in the region. Iran, in this view, was in the business of exporting the revolution and establishing or de destabilizing, actually, the neighboring states. But in Oman's view, this analysis became less persuasive over time. From around 1989, it seemed to us Iran was engaged on a different path, open to a rapprochement with the United States and keen to become part of a regional status quo, in which it would not challenge the political status of its neighbors and in which it could pursue a kind of post-revolutionary normality. After all, let us not forget that Iran has a long track record as a strong and effective U.S. ally. Policemen of the Gulf for fully 20 years before the revolution. In the early 1990s, following the liberation of Kuwait from Iraqi occupation, we were optimistic that Iran might be included in a comprehensive new structure for regional security and stability. We believed that Iran's resistant, or restraint rather, during the war to liberate Kuwait was a clear sign of its readiness to engage. But the policy of containment prevailed. Iran continued to be seen as a threat, as something outside the regional order, as though it was not in fact, a neighbor at all, but an intruder. No serious attempt was made to integrate Iran into a regional security structure. The idea of containment was that Iran's ambitions to wider political influence had to be opposed, and that its influence in places like Syria, Lebanon, and Palestine had to be challenged and reduced. Whatever one's view of Iran's real interests and intentions, it clearly now looks as though this approach has failed. The only success story is the story of the joint comprehensive plan of action negotiated with Iran by the five permanent members of the UN Security Council and Germany and brought into force by UN Resolution 2231. And this was not, this was not the product of containment at all, but the product of precisely the kind of active engagement in dialogue that the policy of, of containment tended to exclude. The second element of the regional architecture is closely related to, but by no means identical with the logic of containment. And that is the Gulf Cooperation Council. The GCC played a role in the maintenance of containment. Formed in 1981, it was, at least in part, a response to the sense of regional insecurity created by the Iranian Revolution of 1979. It is perhaps ironic, but also, given what I have said about containment, somewhat inevitable that attitudes toward Iran which played this role in the formation of the GCC seem today to be a factor in its current crisis. 
Oman has always been a strong supporter of intensified cooperation, especially on security issues between members of the GCC, as is also well known we have reservations about efforts to move towards a closer political and economic union, and we have made our position on this very clear. But our reluctance to participate in future union, which is in any case hardly an issue at present, does not signal any rejection of the GCC as such, nor any desire to leave it. In fact, we have long been a supporter of the idea that the GCC should be expanded and its security dimension strengthened by Yemeni membership. This is also hardly an issue at present for depressingly obvious reasons. The dispute within the organization of a Qatar and sharply divergent positions regarding the crisis in Yemen are compounded by the lack of dialogue. Oman would much prefer to see a conversation among all members of the GCC, and I say all members, with all of them, not just some, through which some of the present problems might be resolved. We want to see the organization enhanced and strengthened. This is, after all, the Gulf Cooperation Council. And without dialogue, there can be no cooperation. Indeed, the current crisis within the GCC is unprecedented because it undermines the very logic upon which the organization was first founded. The final and third aspect of the regional architecture of the past three to four decades is perhaps a little less obviously architectural. Instead, it might be regarded as a kind of cement that helped hold certain structures together and in place, but which, is a, which has been eroding over the years. And I'm talking here about a historical sense of what we call Arab solidarity. Arab solidarity that shaped the way regional governments organized their conversations over the years. These conversations included, of course, those that, look, that took place within the Arab League as well as attempt to forge other alliances either in parallel to or in collaboration with the GCC. And I'm talking or thinking here of the relatively short-lived Arab Cooperation Council, which fell apart very soon after its formation as a result of what was at the time perhaps the single most radical rejection of Arab solidarity. Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. And I'm also thinking of the attempt following the liberation of Kuwait to extend the security apparatus of the GCC into agreement, which would include Egypt and Syria. This attempt, based on the Damascus Declaration of 1991 and its failure, may with the comfort of hindsight, be regarded as an early indication that Arab solidarity would no longer be sufficient to guarantee regional security. At the time, of course, Oman would have preferred a solution based, we might say, on neighborhood solidarity, neighborhood solidarity rather than Arab solidarity, in recognition of the fact that Iran had a more pressing stake in the security of the Gulf 
than did either Egypt or Syria. Of course, Arab solidarity during this period had a great deal to do with Palestine and a collective sense of responsibility and support for the Palestinian people and their representatives in their struggle for statehood and for self-determination and an end to Israeli occupation. This core motivating idea, which had been powerful and compelling for several decades, really suffered badly from Saddam Hussein's attempt to link it to his occupation of Kuwait. Even Syria, formerly one of the states most committed to a strong conception of Arab solidarity, chose not to accede to this logic and opposed Iraq's action. The PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, caught in an impossible predicament as a result of the poison chalice of what happened and what took place of the Saddam's linkage, inevitably lost friends elsewhere in the Arab world as a result of its compromised position. Despite the modest gains initially made as a result of the Madrid and then Oslo processes, the cause of Palestinian statehood appears to have suffered grave setbacks. I am not concerned to apportion blame to any of the parties involved. My point is simply to note that there is today perhaps less optimism, less resolve, and less collective energy in the idea of collective Arab solidarity in support of Palestine. One might say that Arab solidarity has suffered a fate very like the, that experienced by the logic of containment. But whatever the fate of Arab solidarity, the establishment of a Palestinian state remains a strategic necessity for the whole world. Terrorism and extremism will prosper in its absence. After the horrors of the Second World War, it was recognized by world opinion that the Jewish people needed a national home. So after 50 years or so of conflict in the Middle East, we believe world opinion understands the need for the Palestinians to have a home they can call their own. Containment failed. Arab solidarity has weakened. And as to the GCC, well, the future is clearly in doubt. In managing these very considerable challenges, we are firmly committed to inclusivity, to the so-called big tent and the big picture. How can you have regional stability if major players in the region are excluded from the conversation? And how can a zero-sum game make sense when we share a single planet. So, if we are to keep tensions to a minimum, we should avoid the zero-sum game mentality and pay attention to loving our neighbors. I don't mean that we should simply be good to one another, but rather, as in the gospel according to Mark, as in the Sahih Muslim, and in the words of Rabbi Akiva, love your neighbor as yourself. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Syed Bada, for an incredibly rich um, uh, presentation and, uh, and a review of, of Oman's very unique, uh, I would say, and uh, a very significant role that you've played um, in a number of issues over the years and continue to play today as we look at uh, the possibility of a confrontation with Iran as we look at uh, the effort uh, we heard from Martin Griffiths the other day in, in New York, uh, the possibility that there'll be a new push for a negotiated solution to the Yemen conflict. Uh, we had uh, Secretary Pompeo in the region, uh, notable that uh, that the first weekend, as Secretary of State, he spent uh, traveling throughout the Middle East, talking about many of the issues that uh, that you um, just mentioned uh, in your in your presentation. Uh, and so, uh, I guess I guess the the question that I have, looking at this from an Omani perspective, and and uh, I think that uh, that Oman's record is very consistent with your theme of love your neighbor and, and keeping your, your, um, your dialogue going with all of your neighbors. What, what do you see really as the way forward um, in, in the Gulf? I think that there is a growing concern, growing speculation on the part of many, many American uh, uh, many American commentators that we're heading for a confrontation between the Arab world and, and Iran, uh, also between Israel and Iran and Syria. How, how does Oman see a way forward in opening up a dialogue at a time when so many people seem to be closing the windows? Thank you, Jerry. Uh, I mean, I, I just in my presentation wanted first to remind everyone and remind ourselves really of the history and the historic context uh, that uh, we have been uh, dealing with. And uh, it always helps to understand the present if we just go and backtrack a bit uh, on the sequence of events that took place over the years. And again, I think history tells us that as far as at least that region is concerned, uh, dialogue is the key issue. If we break dialogue and there is no conversation, then conflict erupts, mistrust erupts. And, uh, and so nobody really wants, wants that kind of thing. And so in answering your question, I still think that nobody really in our region should sort of uh, prefer the cause of confrontation. We need to engage with each other. We need to engage with our adversaries. So if we have a problem with a country like Iran, we should engage and talk and consult and negotiate an understanding mm -hmm. where we can build trust and mutual respect um, uh, because whether we like it or not, that country is a neighbor. It will remain to be a neighbor forever. And so uh, at some point, one has to come to terms with that reality and deal with it through peaceful means. And I even really dare say that even if, it, it, you know, if Iran is perceived to be a threat for the security, let's say, of Israel, the question is, you know, how do we deal with that? Mm -hmm. we, we, we discovered, through my talk at least, that containment didn't really work. Mm -hmm. So I think only by negotiation and engagement and dialogue, we can really mitigate that threat and bring everybody on the same platform and the same understanding where we can all live together and work together for the sake of stability for all and security for all. So 
One of the questions, and, and uh, I think historically, again, Oman is one of the very few um, governments where we have a very close relationship, and yet uh, at the same time, um, you have a very close relationship with the Iranians. You have an ability to go to Tehran uh, and, uh, and meet with senior Iranian officials to, to work with them on some of, the, uh, some of the issues. One of the concerns that people have is that um, we've all heard what uh, Foreign Minister uh, Zarif has said. We've all seen what uh, President Rouhani has said, uh, very positive things, very, uh, uh, very committed to a regional understanding along the lines of what you've talked about. Uh, and yet, at the same time, we see an Iran that's very aggressive in places like Yemen, uh, very aggressive uh, in terms of their uh, interaction with the U.S. Navy in the Gulf. Uh, certainly very aggressive in, in Syria. And so the question is, when we talked to the Iranians, when we negotiated the nuclear deal with the Iranians successfully, were we really uh, able to talk to the Iranians who count, who are making the decisions on some of these issues, like Yemen, uh, or are we only talking to a facade, um, a... Um, uh, a, a, a front of Iran uh, that is amenable to, open to negotiation, and yet at the back there are people who are making decisions that are very aggressive, very threatening to their neighbors. Well, the way we, we, we look at this very much simply, you mm -hmm. talk to Iran, you talk to the leaders of Iran, mm -hmm. and they represent you know, their policy. I mean, in every country nowadays, there are those who are more aggressive than those who are perceived more moderate, for example. In every country, it's not just in Iran. Uh, and again, the key to all of this is really having a sustained dialogue, a sustained interaction, building confidence, building trust, making that eye contact. I mean, even Oman's relationship with Iran was, was not born yesterday. I mean, it is years and years of engagement and conversations and building, building that trust. It doesn't happen um, you know, overnight. Uh, indeed, you mentioned the, the ACPOA agreement. It was, it was negotiated through engagement, through dialogue. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, not through confrontation. So I think, you know, even building upon that agreement, we will, we will see what happens, what's the fate of that agreement in the few days to come. But we, we argue in favor of building upon it and continuing that engagement mm -hmm. to address any other concerns of the kind that you've just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Through negotiation, through engagement, it's long term, is painstaking, it's not easy, but I think in today, 21st century, we should be talking about dialogue like civilized people, mm -hmm. not about confrontation. Confrontation is going to make everyone lose. Mm -hmm. There's no winner in a confrontation of a military assault. Mm -hmm. I don't think that is the course or the wise course forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, some people would, would argue that the success of the JCPOA negotiation was a result of the pressure that the international community was able to put on Iran economically, politically, uh, that, uh, that in, a, in a sense forced Iran to come to the negotiating table and seek an agreement, and that if you only relied on a negotiation, the Iranians might never have been interested in uh, actually giving up their nuclear weapons Well, there, there was pressure on everybody mm -hmm. to reach an agreement because the alternative, mm -hmm. nobody wanted, surely. Uh, yeah. There was pressure uh, on Iran, but there were pressures on others. And, uh, and even that pressure was done peacefully <laughs> <laughs> uh, through diplomatic means, through all kinds of other means, uh, uh, and it produced results, yeah. yes, but at the end of the day, it was the negotiation and that engagement 
that really helped put that agreement together. Let me ask uh, one more question, and then we'll uh, open it up to the audience uh, to, to uh, invite them to ask questions as well. Uh, last question I'll ask is on the GCC. Um, you uh, uh, made, I think, a, a very clear uh, statement, and, and certainly one that I witnessed when I was in Muscat uh, many years ago of the of the importance that uh, that Oman has always attached to the GCC. I think that we all remember that the Sultan himself was very much involved in promoting uh, the GCC as a military cooperation agreement uh, back in the 1980s and, and uh, early 1990s. But also, uh, I think, in, in December last year, uh, an unidentified senior Omani um, official also made a, a very important uh, observation, gave a, an important interview about the possibility that Oman is uh, assessing that, in fact, the GCC may not survive, that uh, that uh, the way things were going with the confrontation about Qatar, and this was soon after the uh, the Saudis of the UAE announced that they were going to form their own um, their own cooperative agreement. Uh, that uh, that Oman may be forced to look elsewhere for its uh, cooperation. Mm -hmm. What is your sense now? We saw Mike Pompeo in, uh, in Riyadh the other day uh, basically reiterating something along the lines of what you believe of the importance of preserving the GCC as a, uh, as a symbol of, as, a, as an articulation of uh, Gulf solidarity. Do you see that, that the GCC is salvageable right now? Yes, I think so. I think uh, obviously it takes two to tangle. Everybody uh, needs to, to galvanize that kind of momentum again. We are committed to the GCC. We don't contemplate leaving it or anything, as I said. Uh, we're very much supportive, and we support any effort, any effort uh, that will bring a, an end to the current dispute with Qatar. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the prolonging this dispute is not in the interest of the GCC solidarity. It's not in the interest of the whole region. It undermines an architecture that we have really worked so hard mm -hmm. in building over mm -hmm. the years. And so we support all our friends' efforts and regional efforts to overcome this very uh, serious crisis. I mean, it's been allowed to become serious with time, and I think the longer it, 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 pro it is prolonged, the bad it is for security and stability. Uh, so we, we remain to be committed and hopeful. Okay. We haven't lost hope yet <laughs> Good. Uh, that there will be a solution found. Okay. Good. Okay. Let me uh, ask uh, people, and uh, we, have, uh, we have microphones. We have microphones. So uh, please uh, wait when, uh, when, we ask, uh, when we ask you to, uh, to speak for a microphone to come. Uh, the gentleman in the cap. Please identify yourself. Good afternoon. Munzer Sleiman with Al Mayadeen TV. I want to take the opportunity, since uh, we have North Korea situation to come to the Iran situation from the way that this administration has been approached that issue. And we know that it's no secret that Oman played an important role in the negotiation, mediation between the United States and Iran and hosted that. Here we have a situation where <coughs> North Korea have nuclear weapons, could threaten the United States, have missiles, that can reach the United States, while Iran doesn't have nuclear weapon and doesn't have uh, missiles that reach the United States. We, United States, is now engaging in a summit with North Korea. Can you assess the possibility of United States engaged with Iran at some point since you mentioned the issue of containment and other issues 
did not succeed, and whether Oman would be again uh, play an important role in such negotiation, especially that we are coming in maybe 10, 12 days to a deadline about that issue. And what do you think the impact of not of withdrawing from the agreement that United States was entered in? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we are, as I said, very much in favor of engagement. And as now, the North Korean example will demonstrate, you know, um, and we are hopeful, you know, they could, this could be a game changer uh, if, if these meetings are successful and if the summit between the two presidents uh, creates a breakthrough, it would be a very good example. Uh, and if, and I, I agree with you, if, if it can be done with North Korea, why not with Iran? Uh, so we will continue to argue in favor of engagement at all times. And our role as Oman will always be available should we be asked by any party to help in this process. <laughs> Barbara, you have a fan club over here. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. Thank you, Jerry. I'm Barbara Slavin with the Atlantic Council, and we all appreciate the efforts that you've made in, on behalf of the Iran nuclear deal. Do you have any kind of contingency planning if the United States pulls out? What are you telling the Iranians in terms of trying to keep them somehow within the agreement? And I'd also be curious about your, your sense of whether this new condominium of Saudi Arabia, Israel, and the UAE that we see emerging, whether this really has any strong basis or it's just a temporary alignment because of shared concerns about Iran. Thank you. Thank you. Well, <laughs> it's a very good question. Uh, both questions are very good. It's, I don't have the answers fully for every question because there are simply unknowns and uncertainties around. And I try to stay as much as possible from hypothetical scenarios. Uh, but what I do really hope that they will, you know, that the, the, the United States will see the wisdom of staying true to that agreement. The whole world is saying this, not just me. Our friends in Europe, and elsewhere are arguing in favor of this agreement. And the United States, as a leader of this world, I hope will, will pay attention to that and listen to, to that wisdom and, and really stay together with all of us uh, in supporting this and building upon it. I mean, you know, it's not, it's nothing is perfect. This is not a perfect agreement. We all agree. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing is perfect. Uh, there'll always be a concern or another uh, about things. But again, I go to the same key point on the central theme of my argument today. We need to stay engaged. Dialogue is very, very powerful. The power of dialogue can really take us a long way for a better future for all of us. This is a very, very important statement and uh, it's a power to be used effectively for the sake of humanity, for the, all, for the sake of all of us. This is my recommendation. Okay. Sir. Thank you. Uh, this is Ambassador Salah Sarhan. I represent the Arab League in Washington. Thank you, Mr. Abu Saidi, for your presentation. It's a good one and it's a very quiet one. As a Omani diplomacy, velvet one, we like you. I'm proud of your diplomacy, Omani diplomacy. My question or um, uh, my intervention with you now, I heard you, you are talking. I come from Saudi Arabia, by the way. I represent the Arab League, but I come from Saudi Arabia. I heard you saying about. Um, uh, uh, Qatar dis dispute and Yemeni, uh, Yemeni issues, crisis. 
And you know what is um, um, the role of Arab League and what is the position of Arab League regarding this issue. It's not only Saudi. If we talk about Qatar, we are with the peace, we are with the dialogue, with the dialogue and you know that. But still some requirements, it has to be fulfilled by the Qatar if we come to come to, uh, in, into dialogue with Qatar. So we have some, some requirement. We have, I can't say it is condition, but it's still requirement. I, I would like to, to just uh, bring your attention for that because it didn't start in your presentation. There's some requirements. Qatar has to be fulfilled. fulfilled. Also, regarding the Yemen issue, if we come to dialogue, it's still some condition, it's still some requirements by, by, the, by the, uh, some Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, um, uh, Bahrain, uh, Emirat, and, and Egypt as well. So, so we are with the dialogue, we are with the peace, we are with a political solution, but there are some points they have to fulfill. It. Thank you. Thank you. Sheikh Bousaidi. Thank you. I appreciate your comment and I understand it fully. And uh, this is why I also said at the outset of my talk, I'm not going to touch upon sensitivities between us as brothers in the GCC or in the Arab League. All I'm saying that all these problems do require a conversation a credible dialogue. And any dialogue that starts with preconditions, excuse me for saying, I think it's not a dialogue. If you want to have a good, sensible, credible dialogue, we should stay away from any preconditions for a dialogue because you are already prejudging it before even the dialogue starts. That's all I'm saying. Dialogue should be unconditional. Uh, because the ultimate and the common objectives of all of us in the region is to reach a solution at the end of the day. A solution that is a win-win solution for all of us. We are all part of one region. We share the same concerns and the same interests. And we better talk, talk with each other without any preconditions to try and reach that ultimate common objective of peace and stability and harmony. In the back, the gentleman in the back. Thank you. Uh, this is working. Uh, yeah. My name is Dan Silverstein. I'm a private sector a strategic advisor. Excellency, are you aware of any practical value that Jared Kushner has brought to any conversation anywhere in the region? <laughs> Well, look, I, I will not really talk about any particular individuals. Um, as I said, I, we, we do enjoy a very good relationship with this country, with the United States people, with, with every administration. This is a very, very long, outstanding and long-standing relationship of friendship that existed since 1833. We, we hope to maintain it in a positive tone. We hope to be able to give advice whenever we are required to advise on matters that concerns us in our region. Uh, we've done this in the past. We'll continue to do it uh, should the need arises. And I think, yes, I know the current administration took some bold decisions with regard to the Palestinian issue and the issue of Jerusalem. But at the same time, now that, is, that has happened, we can't do much about it, that equally there will be some bold decisions taken by the same administration in pursuit of a resolution of the Palestinian problem and the, and the establishment of a Palestinian state uh, that can honor also all the uh, various resolutions that are associated with this problem. And I hope, you know, uh, the various key leaders in the administration are working on this, and we are yet to hear from them uh, uh, what, what is in their mind along the path of peace in this region. Thank you. Yes. 
over uh, the lady in the red. <laughs> Thank you, Your Excellency. A, a fascinating presentation. My name is Dr. Mindy Reiser. I'm vice president of an NGO called Global Peace Services USA. There's one country whose name hasn't come up yet. It's a little further from uh, where you are, but the country is Libya. Certainly a country in turmoil. I wonder what thoughts you have as to get a peace process going. Um, surely your good offices and your, your diplomatic skills might have something to say. Thank you, and indeed, I mean, I share your, your concern. Uh, the problem in Libya is a very, is another complicated and complex one. I think it is still going to be some time before a process can be in place that is credible and that can produce some results. I know there have been continuous efforts and still are, not just within Libya itself, but among its neighbors in Europe and of course the Arab League in the, in the Middle East. Uh, we've played a bit of a part of that in trying to help them put a constitution together a couple of years ago. Uh, but we will continue to offer advice uh, as much as we can. And I think the key, again, you know, for that country, for a solution for Libya, that solution needs to be Libyan, Libyan-led. It's got to be Libyan led, and we just cannot impose a particular solution on them. So we, we need to help Libyan people to really come to terms with their differences and find a path forward for their future. Uh, I think the same applies uh, for Syria. We, need, we know for, this, for Syria, we need a Syrian solution, and we can all help in that. Uh, but it is also key and crucial for all these problematic areas that the neighbors should be in the same kind of mode of thinking to try and help uh, a country uh, come back together. Uh, one of the complicated problems is that we have a divided neighborhood uh, and also a divided probably international community sometimes in addressing some of these problems. Uh, so we need a consensus building in favor of a solution for a particular problem such as the one in Libya. Let's uh, go over here. Thank you, Your Excellency, for your presentation. Zach Gold from the Center for Naval Analyses. Um, Oman has benefited for the past 40 some years from stable, strong leadership. But eventually there will be a political transition. And as we've seen with the attempts to interfere in political transitions around the region, uh, how is Oman prepared to push back against attempts from neighboring states or regional states of interfering with your eventual political transition? Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, I mean, it's got a little bit hypothetical here, <laughs> you know, the ifs and, and, and buts. Uh, but let me assure you that we are confident enough in the capacity of our institutions and systems in Oman uh, to address any Omani challenge or any Omani problems. Oman is a country that goes back deep in history. Um, it's a very, very ancient uh, country with ancient traditions uh, and customs that are, I think, capable in uh, determining the way forward for the Sultanate and its people. Hamdi Saleh from Egypt. I appreciate very much the gospel you are preaching of love your neighbor. But I thought that, you know, basically this message, particularly because of Oman is friendly of these countries, should be addressed to the three countries 
who need to love their, their neighbor, which is Iran, Turkey, and Qatar. These countries have been intruded, intervened, and really did a lot of harm to Syria, to Lebanon, to Yemen, to Iraq, to Libya, and to Egypt. Where is the love of your country and their policy? And I think the message and the mission of Oman, which is a great mission, is to really impress this po point on them. If, they need, if there is a need for a dialogue, the need for a dialogue comes from them. It's stop talking about the fact that the Iranians are saying, we control four Arab countries, four capitals. Can you imagine what, the, what kind of dialogue you can have this? If you have a status quo, which is balanced against you entirely, where the three powers are really interfering your affairs, creating havoc in four countries, then you say dialogue, it's until you get into a balance and a situation which will be even, then you start the dialogue. Thank you. Thank you very much, but I just want to say one thing. I think, again, I mean, we have learned from our own experiences in Oman over the years, that it is a mistake to start blaming anybody. This game of blame is not going to help anybody. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the young lady in the back. <laughs> Hi, Nazanin Suraj with IHS Market. I was hoping you would share your views on the Iran-Houthi relationship and how that configures in a uh, resumption of uh, talks in Yemen. Thank you. Thank you. The Houthis are Yemenis. Above all, I mean, they are not some alien creatures. I mean, they are part of the fabric of the society of Yemen. And clearly, we have seen a civil war within Yemen taking place. And clearly, we have seen, obviously, a military, uh, there's a war going on, um, you know, uh, in that neighborhood. In that situation, one would expect a particular party to, see, to seek any assistance from wherever it can get, because we are in a situation of war, uh, for it to, to, to be able to, to sustain the war efforts. I don't know to what extent that relationship and how strong that relationship is. But even if it exists, I mean, that is not the only reason why we have a war or why there is a problem called the Yemeni problem. Mm -hmm. There are still fundamental issues uh, that needs to be addressed. Uh, again, that is also based on the concept of dialogue that needs to be in place and a political process to, to be pursued. And a political process cannot be pursued while the war is continuing. So everybody's efforts is really geared of how do we find a way to get a credible ceasefire in place that will allow humanitarian also assistance to flow and allow all these Yemeni players, including Houthis, to come to the negotiating table and forge an understanding and a peace deal among themselves that will address the future. If that is achieved, then there should be no role for any other player in the region. Uh, I mean, Yemen is for the Yemenis at the end of the day, and that is what we really want to achieve. We want to help in that process uh, uh, as much as we can. We are hopeful that the new United Nations envoy can, can bring fresh momentum to the process. Um, uh, and I really, I think it is being clearly established yeah, and there is no clear military resolution to this problem. It's been going on for more than three years. Uh, I think it's time to really try start working more and more, put more efforts in finding a peaceful way out for all sides, everybody in that conflict. Okay. Okay, over here. Oh, Steve. Yes. Ambassador Sesh. 
Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Uh, my name is Steve Sesh. I work at the, Amer at the Arab Gulf States Institute. Um, this is a follow-up, I think, to the previous question. I'd like to get your assessment, if I may, please, of the situation that prevails along the Omani-Yemeni border and what you think the likelihood is that uh, Iran is smuggling weapons and ballistic missile component parts across the border to the Houthis. As far as I am concerned, as far as I know, there is no smuggling of weapons going through the Omani border into Yemen. And if anybody has anything contrary to that, we would welcome any evidence so that we can cooperate and stop it. The border, the border line between Oman and Yemen is a very strong one, and it's quite a vigilant one. It is very difficult to imagine, you know, uh, you know, smuggling taking place through that border. If anything, there could be smuggling taking place from elsewhere. You know, there's an open seas, you know, but certainly not through Oman. I just want to assure you, and this is not the policy of Oman to allow any party to to use it as a platform to hurt the interests of any of our neighbors, period. Um, Eric? Um, Eric Polofsky, a former member of the National Security Council staff. Um, it's good to see you again. Um, I wondered if you might comment on the nature of the Houthi approach to negotiations going forward and whether they, uh, after the death of Saleh, have altered their thinking about what a post-conflict Yemen should look like, what their role in Yemen should be. Um, I've heard, obviously, a number of discussions about this subject. Um, some believe that they want authority without responsibility. Some believe that they um, don't know what they want. And obviously, um, uh, Omani diplomacy could be quite useful and uh, effective in guiding their negotiating approach. We, we don't really guide them. We can advise only. Advise. Uh, and, and, but we also advise others. Uh, not just the Houthis, because our interest really in how do we help create stability for everybody, for the whole of Yemen, and also for maintaining the uh, integrity of that country. Um, I think we share the same objectives with our brothers in Saudi Arabia, that Yemen should remain united and should be peaceful and not pose a threat to any of its neighbors. This is a common objective. From our understanding, when talking with the Houthis, they are open to dialogue, they are open to negotiations, and they want to bring everything to the table of that negotiation. So we need to kickstart that negotiation with all of them. Uh, and there have been already established guidelines for those negotiations whether it's the UN Security Council resolutions, whether it's the outcome of the national dialogue that took place before the war and it was agreed, it might need some adjustments now because there have been clearly some new realities on the, on, on the ground that needs to be taken on board. And there's, there was also the GCC initiatives, which is still something they believe in. So there are elements of the solution that exist. Uh, and there is a framework that they have signed to during the previous administration of President Obama uh, that they have agreed to the framework that was presented to them and signed it off. And so really, uh, uh, you know, there are already ingredients in place that can allow for that process to start. It's just getting the other elements and the other parties to galvanize support for a process uh, of, of a, piece, a political process to, to, to start among them. But uh, certainly I would say uh, prior to that, we really need to see how we could also bring a, a credible ceasefire in place. 
because it's difficult to see how can we get the negotiations up and going while the war is going on and, and, and the fighting is going on. I mean, you need to build some element of trust mm -hmm. and confidence uh, so everybody feels comfortable to go for the negotiation. Have, have you had um, conversations with Martin Griffiths? Are yes. you optimistic that he's going to be able to get something going this year? Yes, he has already been once to Oman mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. had his conversations. And he also met some of the Yemeni representatives in Yemen, and then I think he went to the other countries right. as well. So we're waiting to hear from him what would be the next step uh, forward. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we haven't yet heard anything back. Okay. I think he is still waiting for other bits of information and feedback from the other okay. parties, and I think he's in that process at the moment. Okay, good. Um, let me uh, go here. Well, yes, yeah, we'll come back, Rich. Uh, Robert Mogelnicki from uh, the University of Oxford. Uh, one could argue that um, regional conflicts, specifically the uh, Qatar crisis, have already had tangible economic benefits for Oman. And I'm thinking just specifically about trade volume in the ports of Sohar and uh, Salalah. So I guess my question is, uh, to what degree do economic considerations play in Oman's foreign policy stances? Well, Oman is, uh, as I said, I mean, it's a friend to all and open to business, open for investments, uh, for tourism. Uh, uh, we are happy to partner with, with everybody, really, and uh, happy to, to help and assist in any way possible. Uh, our basic law, constitution, basically, of Oman, which was enacted in 1996, actually stipulates in its economic principles the principle of free market. Uh, and so if we're able to help uh, and also benefit from the same time, uh, why not? Uh, and uh, I really like to, to use the opportunity to, to invite anybody who has not been yet to Oman to come and visit us. It's a very hospitable country and friendly. And I'm sure uh, you will have a very, very good time. And maybe there will be opportunities uh, of economic and commercial interests that can evolve from such visits. One of uh, Anthony Bourdain's favorite places in the world. <laughs> <laughs> we'll uh, ask uh, somebody I think you know fairly well, Ambassador Schmier. Uh, Richard Schmier, Middle East Policy <laughs> Council. Very nice to see you again, Your Excellency. Um, I have some recollection of Oman's previous engagement uh, with Iran and trying to help. I use the word facilitate, not mediate. Um, and two of the strengths that Oman brought to that effort were one, very, very smart ways of looking for confidence building measures to allow both sides to develop. And, and there were many successes along that road. And also, there were many occasions when Oman helped Iran or helped correct misunderstandings that Iran had about the U.S. and our intentions and, and things like that. Now, you happen to have an excellent ambassador in Washington. We now have a new, fairly strong Secretary of State who has the President's ear. So will Oman perhaps be again trying to think of ways to provide some confidence suggestions for confidence building measures or or ways to help Oman better understand some of what's going on here as a means to try to help the kinds of diplomatic engagement that you've described. Thank you, Ambassador. It's good to see you. Yeah. Um, I am looking forward to a series of meetings during my visit of uh, today and tomorrow. In Washington, I'll be meeting senior personnel officials, um, representatives in the various uh, agencies here. And no doubt, you know, uh, questions and topics such as Iran will, will be addressed. 
we'll be happy to share our views. Uh, we're always happy to share our views and offer advice. What is very key in the Omani diplomatic practice and foreign policy that you should understand is that Oman will never impose a particular position. We can lead by example and we can offer advice and we are happy to assist in any way possible. Uh, and uh, this is really the principles that guide our role diplomatically and politically and uh, this has always been the case. In fact, this is a very uh, traditional, ancient policy of ours. And we'll stick to it because it works best for us. Okay. We might have time for one more question. Um, in the back, in the very back. Thank you, uh, Yara Bayumi from Reuters. I had a couple of questions. One, uh, you, sir, were talking about the value of quiet diplomacy um, and what that achieves. That was, that was also something that we'd certainly seen from the Gulf generally for the, you know, over time, but obviously we've seen a shift in that in the last couple of years from specific uh, parties within the Gulf who have obviously not gone down the quiet diplomacy route and have taken a much more assertive and aggressive foreign policy. To what extent do you think that has contributed to uh, the destabilization uh, in the region? And then my second question is on is following up on the economic question. I mean, Oman is suffering from a very significant budget deficit. To what extent, again, do you see your position, you know, your new neutrality position that you advocate, your quiet diplomacy, does that, has that in any way affected possibly gaining some kind of financing from your Gulf neighbors because of these positions that you've taken? Thank you. Thank you. you. Uh, thank you. Again, all your questions are very good and intelligent. <laughs> Difficult to, uh, to, to answer in a, in a nutshell, but uh, let me try. Um, First of all, I mean, we do really understand and do respect also some of the positions taken by some of our neighbors. Whether or not they contributed to instability or stability, that remains to be seen. I mean, you know, we are going through quite a turbulent period uh, for various reasons, or multiple reasons, some are historic as I said in, in my presentation. So that, but we do wish our neighbors all the best. We do love our neighbors, genuinely do. I mean, we wish them well. Their stability is, is important for our stability. And I like to think vice versa too. Uh, we all share that region, we are part of that region. And I think all I'm saying really, the point back again, is that we need to really intensify our conversations and dialogue because there are some pressing issues currently uh, we are going through, such as the one the GCC is going through, and that needs dialogue, that needs real serious dialogue among us uh, to, to overcome these problems. Economically speaking, yes, I mean, uh, Oman is not the only country. All the oil producing countries are going through a difficult time because of the oil price and so on, although it's sort of somewhat recovered Stabilized. recently. I hope it continues to recover. But Oman is pushing forward very, very much hard in its diversification policy of the economy, like everyone else also around us. Uh, I think um, this is a lesson uh, that we should finally and fully learn from and how we can diversify away from oil to sustain progress and growth for our economy, for our people. Uh, I, I think we will be able to do that over time. I know it's going to be, or it has been quite difficult, it's going to be a bit difficult, rough period, but I am, again, I believe in our capacity 
to tolerate this and overcome it with time as people also get used to the idea of, uh, of, of the new ways of doing things. It will be a little bit painful, uh, but that is to be expected and we need to communicate this better to, to, the, to the young people in particular so that there is a, a real partnership between government and private sector, between everybody, to really pull together as a country to overcome this difficult phase. And I'm very much confident and very optimistic about the future. Thank you so much for coming and spending this time with us. Uh, I think that once again, you've articulated what we've all come to know and understand about Oman, the very positive, constructive role that Oman has played historically for these past uh, nearly 50 years uh, that the Sultan has been on the throne. Uh, and, uh, and the important role that Oman has played, uh, as Wendy said, a small country that plays uh, an outsized uh, uh, role and responsibility in, in regional and global affairs. So thank you so much uh, for, uh, for joining us today, and we wish you every success in your discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.